Earlier this week, Arkansas officers, including two deputies and an officer who were shown on video beating a man during an arrest, were suspended with pay. We showed the clip on Rising earlier this week and we will pull it up again now. In it, you can see three officers punching a man in the head and kneeing him several times as they pinned him down. Ugh, just horrible to watch. Founder and executive director of Civil Rights Corps and author of Usual Cruelty, Alec Karakatsanis, who is founder and executive director of Civil Rights Corps and author of Usual Cruelty, he tweeted about the matter, writing, what is shown in the Arkansas police beating video is utterly normal. It's what dozens of my own clients and their families describe to me over the years. Everyone who works in the system knows about it. After Rodney King and calls for accountability, we got the 1994 crime bill. After George Floyd, some Democrats are now pushing for another 100,000 more militarized cops just as reproductive health is criminalized. And Alec is here with us now to weigh in. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, thanks for joining us. So you say you have seen things like this, and I, I, I mean, I know you're right. Obviously, we, we see uh, similarly, occasionally violent videos like this. When they're caught on camera, they, they go viral. They enter the public domain. But if we're only, you know, we're only seeing the ones where it happens to be someone records it, how much more common is it? It's absolutely ubiquitous. Uh, in all of my time, in my years as a public defender, in my years as a civil rights lawyer representing people charged with crimes all over the country, this is the kind of thing that happens every single day in every single city in the country. We had a little joke at each of the public defender's offices that I was at, where if you saw certain charges, like for example, resisting arrest or assault on a police officer, it was almost certain that your client was gonna be in the hospital. And almost to a fault, every time I went into the neighborhood and investigated, I talked to you know, several witnesses each time. I would talk to the client, I would talk to their family. They always had the same story, which is that they were brutally beaten um, by the cops, often tased, sometimes shot. Um, uh, and the they were charged in order to basically cover it up because in, in many places, um, it makes it much more difficult, if not impossible, to sue the police for brutal beatings if you're also charged with a crime. Yeah, and this is part of the conversation we've been having for a while over qualified immunity. After the George Floyd uprising in 2020, many folks who were perhaps unfamiliar with the ubiquity of these kinds of moments were horrified by what they saw on camera. And there was a lot of public support for some substantial criminal justice reform. Unfortunately, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which many folks, again, didn't think went far enough, didn't pass either, in part because of these conversations, these uh, disputes about qualified immunity with conservatives feeling very strongly that they did not want to get rid of it. Uh, what do you make of that ongoing debate? I think obviously qualified immunity is a ridiculous doctrine. Um, it was invented out of whole cloth by the Supreme Court. It has no basis in the history or text of, of the Constitution. It has no basis in the history or text of of U.S. statute 1983, which is the provision that the Supreme Court um, has applied it to. Um, it, it's a complete joke. I, I think it's it's much more important to understand, though, that the, the qualified immunity only applies to civil liability. It, it, mm. The only relevance of that doctrine is whether you can sue an individual cop um, for harming you um, or other public employees and what legal standard is applied to that case. It's often treated by people on the left as some kind of panacea um, for everything that's wrong with, with police misconduct. But even in the places that don't have qualified immunity, um, you're not seeing criminal charges for most mm. of these incidents of brutality. You're not seeing police brutality end. Um, really, all qualified immunity does is shift who pays you if you are beaten. And, and, and in many places, even when there is no qualified immunity, the police are just indemnified by the local government or various forms of insurance. And so it, it's actually, um, I think, kind of a red herring to talk about the issue of police violence and police brutality, which has plagued this country since well before the Supreme Court invented the doctrine of qualified immunity as some sort of solution to this much more significant problem. I just want to also note that it's not just like a conservative or liberal issue. I mean, the biggest proponents of ending qualified immunity are people like the Libertarian Cato mm. Institute and others who have a much more like sort of originalist view and perspective um, on um, sort of textual interpretation of law and also um, 
who, you know, at least in that one area, are more um, able to see the incredible ineffectiveness and inefficiency and absolute horror of, of state-sponsored violence. So what would you suggest, Alec? Is it, what, what, is, what is causing some of the lack of accountability? Is it just these structural issues with how police are recruited and the culture of these police institutions? Is it a criminal justice system that uses a kind of a, you know, a reasonable man standard when assessing whether or not a police member has acted appropriately? And there's this po reasonable policeman idea that basically allows them to act with impunity. What, what would you focus on as one of the core with the core things to shift to, to have better outcomes here? I think there's a very important fundamental point um, that's, that's much more basic than, than any of the things that we're talking about now. And that is that the vast bulk of police violence is utterly legal. So for example, in this country, there are more arrests over the last couple of decades for marijuana possession than for all so-called violent crime combined. Think about what it means to be arrested for marijuana possession or anything else. Um, you are caged, you have metal chains put on your body, you're separated from your children, you're put in a cage where you're unlikely to be given any medical care or your ongoing medications, you lose your job, you lose your house, you're um, extraordinarily likely to be sexually assaulted or to contract an infectious disease. This is perfectly legalized violence. This is the vast bulk of what police do. I don't think most people understand that 96% of what police do is what they themselves call nonviolent. Only 4% of their time is dealt with things like what they call violent crime. The vast bulk of it is, is low level enforcement and surveillance and control and sort of brutal repression of mostly poor people. So that's the, what, what is often lost in these discussions is most of the police violence is legal. So if I was just walking down the street smoking a cigarette, the Constitution protects me from even being stopped by the police. But if I put a little marijuana in that cigarette, all of a sudden the law allows me to be seized, to have metal chains put on my body, to be taken away from my church and my school and my home and my family and my job. That is violent. In any other context, it would meet the legal definition of kidnapping. So when we talk about the need to change the conception of policing in this country, it's much deeper than this. And that leads me to you know, a more direct answer to your question, which is, um, what is the actual purpose of policing? One of the reasons that there has never been a single reform in the history of American policing since 1900 that has significantly reduced police brutality is that most people have entirely the wrong conception of what the police force is trying to do. Most people think that the police force is a genuine, highly trained, well-organized um, government a response to control violence and to protect people against crime. That's actually a, a marketing ploy that the police developed in conjunction with police unions in the second half of the 20th century. Yeah. In the first half of the 20th century, it was much more widely understood that police had like three main functions. Um, early on, um, they were supposed to brutally uh, crush and, 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 and surveil and control um, newly freed black people and, and, and people who are running away from slavery. Um, then as the 20th century began, their main function in the Northeast and throughout the Midwest was to control striking workers and laborers. And, and the sort of third main function of police is to protect the private property and wealth of people who own things. And so those are the historical functions of police. It's only actually relatively recently that they developed this idea that their goal is to serve and protect people. So if you have a force whose actual goals are to control the poor and to crush social movements like they did with the Black Panthers and, and the New Left and environmental movements that we can see them doing with, the, with um, protests to the abortion rulings and environmental protests now. If you actually understand the function of policing as its goal is to violently crush people and, and to crush people who don't have power in our society, then you understand why there has never been a single successful reform. So we need to stop talking about things like the reasonable man standard and the qualified immunity standard. And we need to have a serious social conversation about what are the police doing? Whose interests are they protecting? And why is it that the vast bulk of what they do has nothing to say about what they actually tell us their purpose is? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. If, <laughs> I think that goes a little further than I would be willing to concede even as a, a libertarian. I mean, do, doesn't the concept of policing, I mean, it doesn't even originate, originate in America, right? It originates in, in what, the English tradition in like the 17th, 18th century, right? I mean, that, that was not all, that was about keeping 
street cities and streets safe to some degree. What wasn't it, or am I am I wrong? I think in in early English history, it was really about controlling poor people and debtors. Uh, it was a, it was a way for the rich to sort of um, use state violence in a more professionalized way. I think what I was talking about in particular is really the history of U.S. policing, which I think is beautifully captured in the history, Our Enemies in Blue or The End of Policing, yeah, two, are great, yeah. two great books. I think the if you look at the actual history of U.S. policing, what I was really talking about was what I would call the professionalization of U.S. police over the course of the 20th century. They went from becoming sort of small-time um, roving bands of people that really served the interests of particular political bosses in particular cities mm -hmm. into a massive organized, unionized, professionalized force that has access to incredibly sophisticated surveillance technology, incredibly sophisticated military weaponry. And if you look at the history of the use of that surveillance, of the military weaponry, if you just look at who police are arresting people for, the, police aren't arresting wealthy people for wage theft, right? They're arresting poor people for shoplifting. Um, even though wage theft is a problem about five times all other property crime combined. They're not arresting wealthy people for tax evasion, even though tax evasion is a problem 63 times all other crime combined, all other property crime combined. So you have to look at the evidence of what police actually do, and and then you can look at the history of how they unionized and professionalized and developed and went from sort of um, unarmed people walking a local community to highly professionalized, highly organized, mm. highly political actors. Right. Well. These, uh, these guys got suspended with pay. Uh, didn't our friend, uh, my friend David Weigel, when he, Washington Post reporter, tweeted an offensive joke, suspended without pay for an entire yeah. month? D Dave Weigel <laughs> got the book thrown at him harder than these cops. Been beating someone's head in into the sidewalk. Um, Alec, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And we'll be back with more Rising right after this.